Hi, I'm Daniel. I work at Trend Micro. I'm with my colleague Yaromir. We're going to show you the result of our investigation related to cloud services being abused in targeted attacks. So this is the outline of our talk. After a quick introduction, we will discuss two different approaches of malware infrastructure, one being custom and the other one being cloud-based. And then we will show you different APT cases uh, that use the second approach. And for each of these uh, cases, we will discuss first the uh, how the malware works, and then uh, the advantages and disadvantages from an attacker perspective. Then we'll conclude this talk. So cloud services abuse is not something new. It has already been researched in the past, but in our case, we'll focus on cloud abuse in the context of targeted attacks. And all of these examples are cases that we investigated ourselves. The goal of this talk is to show uh, in the wild cases of cloud abuser but more importantly, how we as defender can leverage this setup to our advantage. So multiple approaches that will allow us to get more information. Uh, but let's first discuss the different kinds of malware infrastructure. The more common one is the custom uh, approach where the threat actor will do all by himself, which means develop and maintain all the, the servers on the code. So this has a lot of financial costs. Uh, the, the threat actor needs to rent a web server, pay for domain name, data storage, and bandwidth. And it's a lot very time consuming because the malware developer needs to think about the communication protocol, so design it, uh, write the actual code, uh, and test it to make it work. And on the other side, administrate, install and administrate a, a command and control server. It has also many disadvantages because uh, from our perspective, I mean, it's easier to monitor and block a uh, domain name which is used only by um, a malware, so which has no legitimate use. It can also be seen called uh, or seized by law enforcement. As the protocol has been designed by the um, malware developer himself, th it, there is a higher probability of flaws and it's also difficult to assess the reliability in real conditions before actually running the, the malware. Uh, the advantage of this approach is that you actually can implement whatever you want. You are not limited by any anything as you are the, the one designing and writing all the code. The other approach, which is the one which will interest us more today, is the cloud malware infrastructure approach. So the, the advantages are that it's developed, maintained by a third party that actually know this uh, domain because it's their work. Uh, it's uh, cheaper, even sometimes it's free. And those services will usually provide an API which is convenient to use. It's very reliable because it's operated by people that need reliability. And it's harder to block or monitor or seize because uh, it has many legitimate uses. Actually, most of the usage of these cloud services are, are um, legitimate. The, the disadvantage that you have is that you are constrained by the features uh, that the API, for example, will allow you to do. But we will see that uh, later. So let's discuss now some APT cases that we investigated that use this approach. The first one is uh, named Patchwork. The group is named Patchwork, and this is the country that are targeted by this group. So the the bad the um, there is a backdoor named Bad News, which actually makes both of these approaches. First, the the malware will connect to a cloud provider, issuing a GET request to retrieve actually uh, the command and control server in an encrypted form. So the malware will then connect to the CNC. So this is like the standard approach. This is how it works in, uh, on the back end, so the, on the malware side. You can see that the, the address of the cloud service provider is uh, obfuscated. And uh, if you go to this cloud service provider, you will see that the, the, the CNC is, is also obfuscated. So we can see this kind of base64 string in all these cases and uh, we reverse the, the, the algorithm and uh, it's very simple actually some some versions 
more recent versions added a blowfish, blowfish encryption layer. But still, once you decode it, you get the, the address of the command and control server, which is usually a PHP script. So this approach actually on the attacker side, uh, the defender side, sorry, what we can do is go to this GitHub that hosts the encrypted CNC. And uh, you can find the history of the GitHub repository. And that's what we did. So for one sample, we actually found the, we, we found multiple uh, command and control servers. So we can see here that uh, on the March 6, the CNC server was this one, this domain name. But then two days later, it changed. I don't know why twice, but it changed to this IP address. So with one single sample, you can get multiple uh, command and control servers. But it's even better than that. You can actually go and use the GitHub search features, which is what we did. And we found with only one sample, 64 different uh, command and control servers. So this is very interesting because um, from a defender perspective, with only one sample, you get all the attacker infrastructure. Another example uh, named Operation DRB Control targeted Southeast Asia. And so uh, there is a malware family we named Type 1. So in this case, there is again a standard CNC channel where the malware operator will send its commands. But there is a secondary actually channel where the um, malware will send uh, information about the computer, infected computer to Dropbox. And then uh, it will look for a file named bin.asc. Uh, and if that, that file is found, it will load it in memory and, and run it. So it's like another backdoor. So what that, the threat actor does is that it will look at the different uh, infected victims. And if one of them looks interesting, then it will drop this file for only for the selected targets. So how does this second uh, file work? So this is a backdoor using only Dropbox actually. So first, from time to time, it will write a single file, like a heartbeat file. And then the attacker can put commands in a, a specific file name. The malware will read that file, execute the commands and write the results in a, another file name that the threat actor can retrieve and read. So as you can see in this case, the only uh, command and control is Dropbox. There is no standard CNC channel. This is how it looks like on the code side. So you can see there is an API key, which is then used to uh, upload and download uh, some, some stuff. So what we did is that uh, with the Dropbox API, we were able to list the different uh, folders that were in that repository and download them. Uh, just by looking at, uh, th these are features that are taken from the Dropbox API. So you can see you can configure multiple stuff there. So it's very um, easy and convenient to write, write this kind of script. And what we found in that rep uh, Dropbox repository are post-exploitation tools. What were the commands executed by the attacker, uh, some victims. Uh, so this allowed also to know more about the attacker's interest because we could see what kind of files the attacker uh, exfiltrated. And also we could find some new command and control servers in, on the, the Dropbox repository. So this was very interesting and these, those are findings that we could have not made otherwise. This, for example, is a summary of our findings. On the left, you can see the commands that were more, most used by the attacker. And the, on the right, the, the top 10 commands that were issued through uh, cmd.exe. So you can see that the redactor first wants to know where he is actually. So it will gather information about the, the target host. Let's discuss now uh, another threat actor targeting mainly Pakistan and named Confucius. So in this case, there is a file stealer uh, that we named pCloud. It uses, so pCloud is uh, also a cloud service provider, which provides an API. So this stealer actually looks for different file extensions on the victim uh, workstation, and it will uh, send them to the, the pCloud repository. 
So in this case, you, you can see there is also uh, an API, but the, the, in this case, there is not an API key to connect to, to the pCloud, but you need um, credentials, so an email and password. And uh, when we reverse the malware sample, we could find actually those credentials hard coded there. So what we did was we went to the to pCloud service, we connect to it, and here uh, difference here is a, an interesting feature is the restore function. So even if the attacker deletes th the files, you can restore them. And something interesting here, and that some attackers do, is that they actually uh, infected their own machine. So they, they tried their malware, malware in their own machine. And so some files were exfiltrated to pCloud from the attacker's machine. And we found this kind of information. So this is, we can see here that the attacker on the left column, you will see the names that the attacker himself gives to the, his own tools. And you can see that the attacker will try them against multiple AV vendors. And uh, this is another interesting file that we found, which is like uh, shows some victims that connected to, to a CNC server. And here you can see that the detractor will actually closely look at those uh, connections and based on the IP address, the attacker noted there is one Indian here among all of these Pakistanis victims. So also this gives information that the threat actor uh, carefully looks at, uh, at the, 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 the victims. Now we let Jaromir talk to you about another uh, backdoor. Also from Confucius, we will talk about Tweety Chat, which is in this case Android chat application. It's backdoored and again, it uses mixed approach. So first it registers to standard CNC server. It sends commands. And one of these commands is updating AWS credentials. And these credentials are used for uploading storm files to AWS. Small pieces of information like SMSs, contact or call logs are uploaded to the traditional CNC server. So for this purpose, we need two keys, AWS key and access key and secret key. And they are uploaded through Google Cloud Messaging or Firebase Cloud Messaging. So by simply reverse engineering the malware, we cannot discover these keys. And we didn't have them well, when analyzing this malware. This piece of code shows the message receiver from Google Cloud or Firebase. And code below is the piece of code for putting object request, which uploads the new object to Amazon S3 bucket. Even though we did not have access to the cloud service, we still found access to the server itself, to the traditional CNC server itself. And in this, in this server, we have seen running several services. So you can see the service for file structure backup, audio service, SMS call logs, call log request, and so on. And again, in this case, operators were testing malware on their own devices. And we have seen this kind of screenshot. There was like mobile number, and this mobile num number helped us to find some person on social media. So at least we can see that in this case, the threat actor is interested in someone working in army or army related, because you can see that this person works, ex works at Pakistan Air Force. Let's continue with another very interesting threat actor. It's called Muddy Water. It's based in Middle East and mainly targets countries in Middle East. The first malware we analyzed was a mobile application which uses Telegram for exfiltration. So again, the beginning is similar to the previous cases, the registration and receiving commands from the traditional CNC server. However, storm files are uploaded to Telegram channel. In the screenshot app, there is the code responsible for
for for creating the request to the Telegram channel. So you can see api.telegram.org followed by token followed by method name. Method name in this case is called send message. This piece of code is called process command and you can see there are several cases. In each case is when it is run it does different functions. You can see get system info, get smart call, taking screenshots, sending SMS. If malware operator for some reason loses the access to the traditional CNC server, there is still one feature that once a day all data are collected from the infected mobile device and sent to Telegram channel. So you can see the screenshot above is the function which is activated once a day and code below is the list of all information. The function name is send all data so you can see which information is collected. So there is system info, contacts, installed applications, call logs and SMSs. For Telegram channel we, take, we can display some metadata about the creator, the username and also language used. So in this case you can see language code FA which stands for Farsi. So this can give us a hint where the threat actor might be based but of course this information can be fake. Now let's move to the last and probably the most interesting threat actors we have recently analyzed. It's called SLAP and it's targeting some victims who have interests in North Korean issues so in North Korea. So for SLAP we observed few versions. So we start with version number one. The name SLAP was given by by letters SL and UB. So in the first version it used Slack, that's why SL, and GitHub, it's like UB letter. So first the malware sends request to just GitHub to get command. Command is then processed, executed, and result is uploaded to Slack. And bigger files are exfiltrated to file that IO service. So we know that this version one is delivered via waterholing and websites related to North Korea. Then when it reads the gist snippet, it looks like this. So there's a list of self-explanatory commands exec task list is listing currently running processes, capture is for taking screenshot, drive list is a list of disks and file list is a list of files in a given directory. You can see that there are like two symbols like caret symbol and dollar symbol and they decide which commands are activated and which are not. So in this case only capture command is activated. For Slack, we need a token. This token was split into several small strings which have been then concatenated together. As you can see in this screenshot taken directly from C binary. Exfiltration to file IO is also very useful for threat actors because the file gets uploaded. Then the link gets generated and they send the link to the Slack channel. File IO has like one feature, when file is downloaded just once, then it gets automatically deleted. So this was version one, but version one had some disadvantages and the biggest disadvantage was that the gist GitHub file was shared between different victims. So the list of commands had been executed by all the victims, which is not very, very practical solution. So in version two, GitHub was not used anymore. Instead of that, they relied only on Slack. So they created Slack workspace. In this workspace, there was a channel for each user named username minus computer name. And then when a command 
needed to be executed, it was created a message. This message was pinned in the channel. Then infected machine reads this pinned message, executes it, and writes the result of the, of the executed command into their specific channel. So again, in the schematics, Slack is for CNC communication, for sending commands, and uh, sending results of executed commands. File I.O. is used for exfiltrating bigger stored files. And there's also like one more thing, one more feature. It's like pen.io, which is microblogging service. And this service is used for updating Slack tokens. So if Slack tokens are reported and disabled, then threat actor might publish new tokens here on this website. And if this happens, the malware finds these keywords like hello, what, and three exclamation marks, parses the new tokens, and update new tokens. So, in GIST, when we, when we come back to version one, so in GIST, we can see this history. And history tells us which commands have been, have been activated and when. And also it gives us some overview like which files the malware operator might be interested in. So in this case, you can see that there is a software called Plusboard, which is a DBS bulleting board system used in Korea. Again, we have Slack API, we have Python libraries, so we can import Slack client. And if we know token, we can call, we can call functions like list, list users, list key information, list channels, show channels info, show channels history, which is the most interesting for us. The channels history is in JSON format, and we can see the text attribute containing the commands executed by the malware operators. Also, we can get links to screenshots, which we can later download. We can also display it. So this is like one example of the screenshot, which we found. You can see that there is some, some text in, in Korean language. So likely this victim was based in Korea. So after seeing all this, after publishing our research, what happened? What's the attacker's reaction? So in case of Operation DRB Control, we published the report in February 18th. In March, we found that type one payload had new API key and also attacker changed the privilege to remove read permission. So we couldn't read the content the directory anymore. And for Slab, a few weeks after publishing our report, the attacker changed from Slack to Mattermost, which is similar but self-hosted Slack alternative. So they had no more problem with disabling Slack tokens. So now we are coming to the conclusion. So the abusing cloud service providers is a worldwide trend as we have shown that there have been different threat actors from all around the world. These services can be used for different purposes. They can be used for stalling, store data. They can be used for sending and receiving commands. They can be used for storing configuration. It has many benefits, not only for attackers, but also for us defenders. So we don't need to hack back. We can just collect some information. We can track attackers in a different way. And in some cases, a little bit easier. So if you are interested in more about our research, you can check like, some of these references. These are the references of the white papers and blog posts we have done in the past. Thank you.